engineer your thought processes are you, in order to be productive. Um, I was listening to a man of God. In fact, let me be, I was listening to Pastor Poju. And he made a statement that I had never seen in that light before. Uh, he was talking about the life of John, the Baptist, who had to come and prepare a way for the coming of Christ. And he quoted that scripture in Isaiah 40, where the Bible says that John came to prepare, the highway will be made, and the mountains will be leveled, valleys will be filled. And we know what was said about John the Baptist, that he came proclaiming uh, a message, preparing the hearts of the people. And the Bible refers to him as Jesus' forerunner. Now, what, I, what he said that was so intriguing was the fact that uh, in the ministry of John the Baptist, he didn't perform any miracle. John the Baptist, as great as he was, in fact, Jesus said, of all the prophets, born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. And that's a very powerful statement to make. Hear this. Um, because what Jesus was saying is that John was in the category of Elijah, was in the category of Elisha, was in the category of all these great prophets who read about Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the likes. And he said, of all the prophets, none under that old covenant, is greater than John. Yet, John did not perform any miracle. So what was so outstanding about John, are you with me, is because John was the one who prepared the hearts of the people so that when Christ comes, his glory will be made manifest. And this is what Pastor Pudu said that, 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 that blessed me. He said that external factors cannot bring about the glory of God in your life until something has happened on the inside. And this is the whole idea, actually, of this whole mental, mental pathways that we're talking about. You know, John the Baptist came proclaiming, preparing the way. That means before God can do anything new in your life. Am I talking to someone? Before God can do anything new in your life, they first of all have to be a mental preparation. Things that have to happen on the inside of you. Things that need to be cleared out so that the glory of the Lord will be seen in your life. Dr. Bill Winston said, that the only thing stopping the high life, if I use the word successful and happy life, <laughs> he said the only thing stopping it from manifesting in the life of a Christian is that thing between one ear and the other one. Your mindset, your mindset can stop the glory of God from uh, manifesting in your life. Are you with me? I'm always reading that scripture to you in the book of Psalms where the Bible says that the children of Ephraim uh, armed to the teeth on the day of battle, they did what? They turned back. They, they, they ran back. Why? It's because though they were out of Egypt, Egypt was still where? Was still within them. So, our minds are powerful tools given to us by God. Uh, the mind has been sort of demonized in church over the years, you know. So, a church has been raised to think very little of the mind. We talk about the spirit. And... Uh, we fail to realize that without the mind, are you with me? Everything that God wants to do in our lives would be impossible. First uh, uh, Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Maybe we should read that scripture. Are you with me? First Thessalonians 5, verse 23. If you can quickly put that up for me, I'll be super grateful. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you how? Completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be what? Preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what I, I think I shared this last week. That if you look at the man, his two-third of him is spiritual. Uh, the only part you're seeing and you're relating with is the physical part. But man is spirit, soul, and body. I know sometimes they say we are spirit, we have a soul. And uh, we live in a physical body. No, no, no. You are spirit, soul, <laughs> and body. Because if I slap you, you wouldn't say, well, that's no problem. You didn't touch my spirit. You are going to, you're going to react. <laughs> in fact, you're going to say, why did you slap me? <laughs> now, so you are spirit, soul, and body. But then we must understand how God made this trapezoid being in order to function. Your spirit is the part 
when we say that you are a new man in Christ Jesus, hear me. It is your spirit man that is the new man. Because it was dead, but when you receive Jesus as Lord, that spirit man has been reconnected back to God. That means you can, you can access the things of God. It means God is alive in your spirit. If a man is not born again, it doesn't mean his, his spirit man is inactive. He might be spiritually dead. Are you following? But the concept of spiritual death is that you are alienated. From the life of God. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, so when we say that a man who is not born again, the spirit of a man who is not born again is dead. We're not saying that that death means non-existent. You get it. We're only saying that that man's spirit is not alive to the things of God. And death means separation. It means it's separated from the things of God. But it is connected. That spirit is connected to the things of Satan. Because he has the nature of Satan. That is the reason um, that is the reason people, you hear of people who are in the occult, they are, they are accessing those demonic forces, not through their minds. When you hear that someone is in the occult, someone is in some form of fraternity, that person is accessing that region, that realm, through his unrecreated spirit. Did you get that now? So you need to get that. And you see, in life, if you want to stand out, if you want to be exceptional, <laughs> you're either in the, like I heard someone say, you're either in the secret place or you're in a secret cult. <laughs> and it's so true. There is nobody that is not touching something that is succeeding. Don't be deceived. There, there are regions of success, regions of wealth that no human being can access without power. And this power is from a spiritual source. Are you following? So you, you, you don't 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 miss that. Don't miss that. So if you see anybody in any any uh, sphere of life that is outstanding, the simple truth is that there's something the person is accessing. And as a Christian, it's not just enough to say I'm born again. You should your spirit man now that is alive should be fully connected to God. This is why your worship is very very important. Do you get it? This is why you cannot succeed without worship. What did Satan say to Jesus? You know, I, I said this some weeks ago. What did Satan say to Jesus uh, uh, when he brought him to that mountain? He said, if you fall down, you worship me. What is he saying? Pour your heart into me. Are you getting me? You know, make me your focus. Give me your attention. And I'll give you all these things. Let me own your spirit. That's why a Christian who wants to succeed and then is wishy-washy with his spirituality is going to have issues. You come to church when you feel like coming. I, I tell Christian, I say, I say, you're not worshipping Satan? You're not truly really worshipping God? <laughs> you're standing on uh, <laughs> neutral grounds. You'll be caught in the crossfire. Hope you know that. In a war, they always say the worst place to be is neutral grounds. Either you are with the enemy and make the other person your enemy, or you'll be on this side and make the other person your enemy. You are safe on one side. So, but a lot of Christians, they get born again, they're just standing, you know, they, they, they don't want to take the things of God so seriously, you know, they don't want people to see them as being too what? Too spiritual. They say, I don't want the kids where people start saying, why am I too spiritual? I'm, I'm taking church at my pace. Brother and sister, do not take church at your pace. If you want to succeed, take church to the full length and as fast as you can. But aside that, you also have a mind. There is a mind. And this mind, hear me now, this mind is the channel through your world. Everything from the realm of a spirit that manifests in a man's physical world is through his mind. So your mind is like a door between the spirit and your world, your physical world. Are you with me? Your mind is a doorway. And the mind was given to you to create. Let me say this. We are inspired in our spirit, but we create with our mind. So, when inspiration comes, it's in our spirit. But when we are going to create something, when we are going to translate that inspiration, it is through the what? It is through 
the mind. So the mind is very, very important. The mind is, God has a mind. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2, go there, let me show you. First Corinthians chapter 2. Who has known the mind of God, the Bible says that he should do what? That he should instruct him. First Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, give me from, no, give me from verse 6. Let's start reading from verse 6. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, not the wisdom of this generation, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we, say we, we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery. And he says, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Uh, and I told you, if you, you remember when I was talking about getting understanding, I said that wisdom is spiritual. Wisdom is not your ability to tell proverbs. Wisdom is your ability to access solutions, access information from a realm higher than you. Wisdom is metaphysical. You follow? Wisdom is what people use to practice sorcery. That is wisdom. And the Bible says there's a wisdom for us that is ordained for our glory. The Bible says this particular wisdom, and we know what that wisdom is. Because if you read 1 Corinthians 1.30, it tells us that Christ has been made to us wisdom from God. That means if a man, hear me, truly studies Christ, there is no cult on earth that can keep him down. Christ has become the logic of God to us. Are you with me? If you really understand Christ, you are unstoppable. That's why it's not just enough to be born again. You need to study Christ. You need to study Christ. You need to learn Christ. Is that not what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4? He said, you have not so learned Christ. There is a place for learning Christ. And what is learning? Learning is what you teach yourself. And learning comes through the, through the avenue of experience. Is somebody still with me? See, you can go to school, have a first class. They now put you in a real life situation and you will not be able to solve it. And you will see the guy who didn't have a first class put in that same situation and the guy will say, well, I remember when I used to work with my uncle. This is how we used to do this. The person will bring the solution that your first class couldn't bring. You were taught something and you got a first class. But the other guy, through experience, learned something. It's what you learn that you can use in life. You can have an MBA in business and squander a billionaire. Are you with me? But a boy who grew up in a labor market, if given a billionaire, if you come back in a year, he will give you two billion. Why? You were taught something, but he learned something. So after being taught something, hear me, you now have to engage yourself with the knowledge of that thing to produce results. And that is why it's not possible to learn without being in situations to put to practice the things that you have learned. Because when you start putting to practice in real life situations, are you mean? The things that you have been taught, there are things you will discover for yourself. That it doesn't always have to be like this. If somebody with me. So the Bible says, Christ is the wisdom of God. And in verse 8, it says, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Or in essence, if you truly understand what the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is about, you are made. So it says, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Is that what I was saying to you a while ago? Where does inspiration come from? It comes from God in your spirit. God reveals things in your spirit. And it's true worship. You see, I, I tell people, what is one of my favorite times of service in church? Is worship. The worship session. In fact, there is no time we come to church and we are worshiping. Singing. You know, some of you worship ends with singing songs. So, if you don't like the 
If you don't like the song, you switch up. Say, hey, they should sing that my favorite song. <laughs> it's not your favorite song. Sing the one that they are singing right now. But in worship, if you truly connect with God and you forget who is standing next to you and your eyes are upon God every single time, there's no time I've come to church that God didn't speak to me. There's no single time. Even this morning, if I said something to me, I quickly had to put it down before coming up here. Because when you are alive in worship to God, ideas always come. Information always come. Now, hear me. That is what we call inspiration. That inspiration is what I will take back now and process in my mind and create a mental pathway to get results. I don't know if you got it. So I'm inspired in my spirit. See, people who write songs, people who write songs, and they are, part, they are, they are also pathways to the spirit. People who write songs, why do you think they are always high on drugs? or Their songs come from, you know, their stimulants. There are things that help them get into that realm. You know, I won't call their names, or you know them. Or the, you look at creatives, you know, they, they take Indian hemp, they take aka marijuana, I get me, or Igbo, and they take it, uh, they drink. And it's like it's when they are drunk or they are high that their best comes out. It's because that's the only way they levitate. Let me tell you what happens to people when they are drunk. So have you been drunk before? No, even if I was, I didn't remember. I don't remember. But I've never been drunk. Uh, okay, leave it. Amen. <laughs> but let me say something. <laughs> what happens when you're drunk is that the mind and the body are suppressed so that your spirit can levitate. This is the reason drunk people often see certain things. They see things. You know, I, I watched a Nigerian movie years ago. Then they have not even improved. And there was a story, of, there was a particular guy that was drunk in that village. He was, he was, a, he was called a drunk, somebody the drunk. And any time he's drunk, he'll start saying things. He said, look, this person is going to do this. This is a person going to see this. They will laugh at him. He was later now discovered that all the things he says actually happened. So they were wondering, how does he access that information? You know why? When he's drunk, are you getting me? When he's drunk, his flesh, his senses are suspended. The things he's saying, because what is stopping you from hearing God is flesh. Is your senses. Your body is distraction. That's what actually stops you from hearing God. I always tell you, if you are over, if you are always full with food, you cannot hear God too well. People who eat too much food don't think well. You should basically just eat to be alive. Not be alive to eat food. Food does not, you don't have a covenant with food that you must finish it. You know, you don't have a covenant with food. If you see it, you must finish it. I pledge to food my, <laughs> to be faithful, loyal, and honest. You don't have to be faithful, loyal, and honest to food. Just eat when you are full, when you are okay, just do what? Just, just stop. And it is good to even stay hungry sometimes. Because hunger causes your flesh. When your senses are down, your spirit is alert. If you make people hungry for too long, I don't know, I know I'm going off a bit, but I want to. If you make people hungry for too long and you starve them and you use poverty, as a weapon for keeping people under. What, they, what you fail to realize is that you are opening up their spirits to things you do not expect. You'll be amazed what, what that person, you know that person probably has never thought of stealing something, has never thought of stabbing you. You discover that the more hungry the person is, the more alert he is. If the person is born again, we call it fasting, so he's more alert to the spirit of God. If the person is not born again, he's also fasting. Are you getting me? But he's alert to this, to demons and devils. And the things that we do, you say, well, I never expected that this kind of person would do this kind of thing. You don't know what has been happening. You don't know the demons that have been inspiring such a person. 
Do you get what I'm saying now? So as a Christian, you need to spend time in fasting. Fasting is not only when they call fasting. Even the one we call sometimes, you don't do it. But start from the one they call so that you can hear. Too much food keeps your senses alert. And it's the truth. That's why if you are, if you are, if you are always eating, you, you know, you, you, you know when, you are, when you are full, either you sleep. If you don't sleep, what do you do again? You, know? you want to watch a movie. You want to, things of the flesh. You know, but if you are alert to the Spirit of God, He will speak to you. Now, people who, who, who are in, into, who want to get inspiration, you see them taking drugs, taking hard substances. You know, <laughs> they ask fellow ones that why is he on hard drugs? They say nobody has the right to call anything hard drugs. What is good for him is good for him. The government should regulate what he wants to regulate for people. He said, because he knows how it helps him. So you can understand that when he takes those hard things, his body, you know, you see him when he's gone. You know that when they are gone, their spirit is now open. Then the demons that inspire those songs begin to inspire it. Then with their mind, they create it. They go to a studio and create it. And by the time it comes from the spirit, passes through the mind, hello, when they begin to play it, oh my, you can't resist it. Because anything that comes from the realm of the spirit influences the natural. So Paul says in Ephesians 5, do not be drunk with wine, wherein is excess. He says for you now, you can't smoke it, but it's a cheap alternative for a real, a real thing. He says, you now pray in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now, pray, when you pray, <laughs> Listen, I'm going somewhere. I, I know I'm talking to charismatic. When you pray in the Holy Ghost, you will get inspiration because praying in the Holy Ghost is worship. In fact, it's the highest form of worship. The time is coming, Jesus said, when you will no longer worship on this mountain. Are you getting me? Uh, or you need to be in a particular place to worship. For the Father seeks those who will worship him in spirit and what? In truth. So there's spiritual worship, which is primarily praying in the Holy Ghost. Listen now, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, your spirit is inspired through what? Ideas, thoughts, words. But a lot of Christians stop there. Inspiration does not bring success. Did you hear me? If you all agree with me, there are many things you've been inspired about that, it, that nothing came out of it. It's not, it doesn't stop there. You know, how many of you have had ideas? God has put things in your heart. You were inspired. Let me see your hand up. You know, when you were praying, you saw things. You were inspired. Inspiration does not lead to success. It's where it starts. But after you are inspired, the Holy Spirit drops thoughts, ideas in your heart. And listen, when we talk about thoughts and ideas, we're not talking about things that are new. We're only saying something is born in your spirit that has its origin in, from the realm of the spirit. Are you with me? Your mind now has to do what? Process it to be able to birth that thing that has been dropped in your spirit. So the Bible says, who has known the mind of God? Uh-oh, the screens are down. Let me open my Bible. If you're getting what we're saying, let me see. But I see all of you here. You are all, you see, you are all happy and successful. <laughs> just, just, just stay with these things I'm saying. Hallelujah. It's not 2 Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Because it's not, it's not difficult to succeed. It's not difficult. Success is your, is your inheritance. Can someone help me? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 2. But God, okay, verse 9 says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Entered into what? The heart, 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 your spirit. He says, but as it is, okay, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. His spirit to spirit. The spirit of God has revealed something to me because the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Then he says, for what man now knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. He says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, because there's a spirit of the world, 
but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Then he says in verse 13, these things also we speak, uh, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but with the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Amen. With spiritual. Uh, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, anytime I read this scripture, I'm happy. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Amen. For who has known, look at it now, who has known the mind? Notice at first he says, who knows the things of the Spirit of God? Because God is a spirit. Now he now says, who knows the mind of the Lord? So God is a spirit. God has a mind. Now it is his mind that he used to create everything that we're seeing. I mean, and I'm going to show you that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So let me pause. Amen. What are we saying? Hallelujah. That if you do not know how to engage your mind, you will not be able to create things in this world. And after being saved, your world will still look normal. Because whatever comes into this physical world is through the mind. If you understood what well, I said, let me see your hand up. Your mind is a creative tool. Say amen. This is why an empty mind is an empty life. When the mind is empty, the world, your world, your life, everything around you will be empty. So if you look at your life currently, are you mean? It just shows either how you are thinking. Amen. Either shows how you are thinking or it shows what is conditioning you. Now, if you want that environment to change, what you need to do is inject something with a different mindset. i give you an example. If you go to somebody's house right now, go and look at their room. You can tell why their life is the way it is. How you do one thing is how you do every other thing. This one is hanging here. That is hanging here. The same way if you give them a task to do, they will put this one here, they will put that one here, they will put that one here. You don't do, your, there is a way your mind is conditioned to arrange your world. You go to someone's house, the house is also scattered. The person goes out. You bring another person into that house. Same house. The same house you didn't want to drink a glass of water from. You bring another person into that house. The person comes there. Maybe you are away. The person comes into your room. You know, there's the way the person is thinking. Why is this house like this? The person begins to put things in order. If that has happened to you before, let me say Okay, if you like, don't put your hand up. It's the truth. That everything is rearranged. You come to the house. You like it. You like it. Like wow, I like this. Guess what? Give it two days. What will happen? That house will be as scattered as it was. You know why? That is how you are. That is how your mind. Your so it's not about what you like. It's about how your mind functions. I've seen people, you know, sometimes when I talk with folks, even my staff and all that, and I'm, and I'm seeing how things should be, you know, they are wondering, what is okay? What is wrong with this? Because the longer you stay in a dysfunctional environment, the, way, the, the more your mind is programmed to accept dysfunction. And if they take you to a place where things are functioning, it's just a question of time. You will bring that dysfunction into the place because you cannot do what the mind has not accepted.
So, when we get born again, Jesus is in our spirit. The life of God is in us. He wants his glory to be made manifest. There is something that needs to be done. What is that thing? The spirit of God now has to begin to help us re-engineer our minds. So in Romans chapter 12, go to Romans 12. I beseech you, or I'm begging you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or worship. And do not be conformed, say conform, to this world, but be transformed. Are you with me? By the what? Renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice, he said, do not be what? Conformed. What does it mean to be conformed? To be conformed means to take after. But God did not call you to take after the world. God called you to be transformed. From the world. And he didn't say be transformed by the renewing of your clothes. People want transformation, but they don't want to go through the process. The process of transformation is the renovating of the mind. So, you don't want to keep falling sick. You're tired of being broke. Hello? You know your life can change. The Bible says you can be transformed. Transform is from two words. Trans and formation. Formation means form. Form. You know, when you talk about the form of a thing, and when you talk about trans, it means moving from one place to another. Transportation means you move from one port to another port. It means you move from, and a port is a place. So when we talk about transportation, it means moving from one place to another when we talk about transformation, we are saying moving from one formation to another formation. Uh, that means there's a particular form that your life is taking right now. Probably you don't like. Are you me? You don't want to remain like this. How many of you want some transformation here? You want some change. You want another, probably you want another house. You want another, you know, you want to have better income. You get it? You want to have... Uh, you want to be able to buy a house too and stop paying rent. For some of you, you want to even move from the current location where you are. You've lived there too much. The noise is too much. You want to go to a more quiet neighborhood where you can take walks in the night. Are you me? You want a change. Now, it is not by changing your clothes. The Bible says it's by renovating your mind. That's, the word renew there is renovate. And when we talk about renovation, if you have ever renovated the house, it means you pull down and take away some existing things so that you can bring new things into that place. That means the way you are going to change from that neighborhood to the other neighborhood is not by borrowing money. It is not by complaining. Can I even say something? It's not by worshipping. It's not by prayer. If it's prayer, your grandmother in the village would have moved into the town by now. It's by renovating what is going on in your mind. Meaning there are some things in your mind that is not allowing that change to come. Can I tell you this? If you borrow money to buy a car, <laughs> hmm? it's going to get old. If nothing has happened in your mind, when that car gets, in fact, you will not stay long with that car. You will need to borrow and to get another car. 
Hear me. Someone says, are you saying it's wrong to borrow? No, 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 no. <laughs> if you have traveled in your mind to a place, you can even go and take a loan. But it is dangerous when you have not moved in your mind and you go and take a loan. They will lock you up. So this mental transformation we're talking about, this movement in your mind, this renovation is the key to a change in your form. Now, when we talk about renewing the mind, a lot of Christians, because some people say, ah, Pastor, I've been reading the Bible, I've been reading the Bible, I've been confessing. If you are like that, let me tell you, I've been confessing, I've been speaking, I've been so easy. Let me tell you something, calm down. That's why I'm your pastor, I'm here to help you. Renewing the mind is not having many scriptures in your mind. You can buy plenty of furniture into a house. It doesn't mean that the house has been renovated. Renewing the mind is not even quoting many scriptures. I've seen Christians, before you say anything, they say, yeah, like the Bible says in Second Thessalonians, you know, have faith. Before you say anything, yeah, the Bible says that... The Bible says, the Bible says, why are you still like this if the Bible said? So this renewing the mind is not in the multitude of scriptures. It is what the scriptures have done to your mind. You know why I'm saying this? When Paul wrote the letter to the church in Rome, and he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There, were, there was no Bible. Hello? Do I have a weakness? So, when he says renewing the mind, he's talking about reprogramming the mind. Re-engineering the mind or rewiring your mind to think in a particular way. This is the same thing he says to the Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Some people say, ah, Pastor, I've said, I know up to five healing scriptures now, but I'm still sick. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Don't sleep, bro. <laughs> he says that you put off concerning your former conduct. What is former conduct? There's a way you have been doing things. You have to stop doing that. You can't, you know, someone says it's insanity when you do the same thing expecting a different result. So that's what he's saying. Put off your, put, that you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Meaning what Paul was saying to the Romans when he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Is what he's emphasizing here. And here he uses a term that is what bearing note. He says, and be renewed where? In the spirit of your mind. That means your mind has a spirit. And let me explain the word spirit. Spirit means core. Means the most important part. The reason that organ that pumps blood in your body is called the heart is because it's the most important in your human body. A man was shot. A bullet passed through his skull. A surgery was performed. He's, he lived till he was almost 80 something years. With the bullet in his brain. He didn't die. You know your whole brain is more like an electrical circuit. So if, the, if something doesn't touch any part that will affect you. You can be living normal. It's just that there's, if it touches a particular part. You might not be able to do anything with that part. Your, your, your brain is truly like a brain box. <laughs> it controls everything, what you see. That's why if, if something affects the part of the brain that controls the eyes, you go blind. Even breathing. But the, the bullet was there. But you will not hear that a bullet is in somebody's heart and the person lived. They can cut your leg, you will live. But if something affects your heart, you will not live. Now, 
That's because it's the most important part. Two people are having a misunderstanding and you can't seem to solve it. So let's go to the heart of the matter. What are we saying? Let's go to what is causing the core of this thing, what is causing this issue. Because the way it's looking, it's obvious that these things are peripheral. Have you ever tried to solve a case like that? You know, I was talking to two people, husband and wife. Sometimes husband and wife can be very deceptive. They'll come and be quarreling about things that don't exist. The real issue is there. So I said, look, brother, let's go. What is the real issue? Let's say it. And uh, when they said it, we had peace. Amen. So there is a spirit of an issue. When he says the spirit of your mind, he's not saying that there is a spirit of your mind. He's not saying your mind has a spirit. He's saying that there is a core part of you, meaning that the mind is more than just one part. Now, this is what the psychologist, the spirit of the mind is what the psychologist calls the subconsciousness. The part of you that, the part of your mind that controls the things that you do. I love something uh, uh, Pastor Chris Akilomi, one of my mentors, said. He said that when we talk about the mind, it goes beyond thinking. He says it's a conceptual process that starts with an, with an idea that is processed. Are you getting me? that finds a way to gain expression until it executes it in actions. So when we talk about the human mind, are you hearing me? It means it's a thought through process. Before somebody gets up to stab someone, it came as a thought. The person now processes, how am I going to do it? Are you getting me? Then the person, it's even within the mind, the person will say, look, I can, do I have the courage for it? Then the person will now psych himself up, then take a, a knife and say, this is where I am going to meet the person and this is why we stab the person. The person has thought it through. That means it's something that has been processed in the mind and then comes to the point of execution and then it's executed. Are you with me? This is the reason that if you accidentally hit someone and the person dies, you are not charged to court because it was not what? It's not committed. It's not premeditated. It, people kill people and go to court. You know, there's this I like watching ID, you know, investigative discovery and on, C on the DSTV. And it just shows the human mind, how it works. There's something they call the perfect murder. People think of how they can kill someone and they will not catch them. Listen, it is not the killing that is the issue. It is the mind that processes that thing to the point of execution. Are you listening to me? But you see, I'm standing on the cliff and somebody, I mistakenly push someone and the person falls. Nobody's going to charge me to court because life does not punish mistakes. Neither does it reward mistakes. Are you getting me? It punishes and rewards intentionality. A premeditated murder is murder that has, that somebody sat down, are you getting me, planned and executed. So let me tell you, if you are going to succeed in anything, if you are going to be successful, in it, I, I use a negative example because that's what you will know. This is the same way. If you are going to succeed in business, you cannot just get up and copy what somebody has done. You also have to be intentional to sit down. Are you with me? Conceive it. Your mind accepts it. Then it will play out in life. You cannot succeed within if you have not. If you cannot succeed without if you have not first succeeded where within. So Paul says, be renewed. Where? In the, in the spirit of your mind. That means in your conscious, in your subconsciousness. Let something be established. Listen, and when something is established in your subconsciousness, you cannot fail. A lot of us are trying to do things that we have not, we are not conscious of. And hey, pastor, I'm going to do this. I'll start doing this. Stop thinking about what you're going to do. First of all, do what? Start conceptualizing it.
Do I have a weakness? <laughs> Give me verse 24. Ephesians 4, 24. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Amen. Uh, if, uh, Exodus chapter 13. Let me show you something. Exodus 13. Give me New Living Translation. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. Let me say something. Spiritually speaking, you cannot become who God wants you to become by any external factor. Should I say it again? You cannot, you cannot become what God has destined for you to become by any external factor. That if God takes you and puts you in a particular place, then his purpose will be fulfilled in your life. No. Jackpot will not fulfill the will of God in your life. You can experience a miracle. It doesn't mean that you have been renewed in your mind. Concerning money, hear me. You can have a miracle of finances. It doesn't mean you'll be rich. Being rich is a mindset. See, that's why every one of you here in April, when we start level 3, level 4, and 5 of the Total Life Development Program. Register for it and attend it. It will help you. Because ah. <laughs> I taught some things that how to be rich. You can be praying in tongues till Jesus comes. If your mind, if something doesn't change here about money, you will not be rich. See, salary has never made anybody rich. You will not be the first. All the rich people in the world don't collect salary. Mark Zuckerberg is not on his salary. Jeff Bezos is not on his salary. All this testimony, glory be to God, hallelujah, amen. They've increased my salary now. I'm earning 2.4 million naira monthly. Listen to me. Salary means money for salt. You can, you can and should start there. Salary is your first point of income. But it is not your pathway to wealth. Uh -huh. Let me leave it. Because, I'm, because some of you, the only way you're thinking is, that's what I'm saying, mindset, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself, but I want to reach there before I stop today. Your, how do you think about money? How you know the mindset that somebody carries is when the person finds himself or herself in a situation. Their default response is the mindset that they are carrying. For example, you need to do something. The first thing that comes to your mind is where can I borrow money? That means in your mind, the only way you can have money is to borrow it. When elections draw near, that's when you will know where, what Christians really believe the Bible has said concerning economy. Hey, no, it must be this person. It must be that person. It, must, it has to be this person. You will know that their mindset is not shaped by values. It's shaped by candidates. If you see the way Christians quarrel and fight during election, 
I remember when Tango is no longer president. I'm going to say my mind. When Buhari was standing, you know, to run for president. So one brother, he almost beat me up. A pastor in this church. He almost, in fact, we're talking, he got up and said, sir. I said, wow. It was a huge shock. I just kept quiet. Two years later, I called him. You no, know, we were talking. He came. And they were talking about how things weren't working. And he, he started, I said, keep quiet. You don't have any right to talk. He said, sir, I've repented. I said, I've not repented. You're only being humbled. A lot of people in life are not humble. Situation has just humbled them. But you see his mindset, because I was trying to bring out certain truths from scriptures, and he was talking about, he was talking purely based on sentiment. Do you know, you'd be amazed in church that when we want to vote for candidates, we don't even think about their systems of government, what their mindset about certain religious values. Are you with me? America is suffering it today. They are not thinking about the value system of the person. They are not even thinking about the person's perspective of economy. Someone says, what, what is Pastor Aramay saying? This is the mindset I'm telling you. When a husband and a wife are always quarreling, it is a mindset. Listen, two good people can fight because they are operating in different worlds in their mind. So, the mind is very, very powerful. The mind is very, very what? It's very, very powerful. That's why the Bible says we must renew our mind to the word of God. Hear me, God wants you to think in a particular way. Exodus 13, verse 17. <laughs> oh, God, I love you. The Bible says, when Pharaoh... Finally, finally let the people go. Let me pause and say something. Don't worry, man. <laughs> you know, when you are young, you can't wait to leave your father's house. Because your father is Pharaoh. I mean, <laughs> if, if, if you have been there, you can't just wait. When I own my own house. when I'm, Because you are just thinking about owning, being, you are thinking of freedom, in terms of being in charge, you want to call the shot like your father called the shot. I was telling some guys the other day where I grew up in the estate in my growing up days, we didn't, we didn't know anything like power failure because the company constantly supplied for power, power 24 hours, seven days a week. There was constant power. So even when people used to complain that power is not stable, I didn't understand it. The estate we constantly had, we constantly had water. And then there was something known as maintenance office. So if your bulb goes bad, you go and file an inventory, they'll come and change it. So we didn't use to buy everything. It was part of the benefits of your parents working in the company. You didn't even buy soap. You go and collect them at the maintenance. Everything is there at the maintenance office. And we didn't cut grass. There are people paid to cut the grass. See, it, let me tell you, comfort sometimes can be the greatest disadvantage to someone in life. Because some of the children that grew up with me in that place are the most useless children I've seen currently. No, I'm being, I'm being very, very, I'm being very, very honest. There's a particular brother in this church who is a pastor in this church. His father also worked with the same company, but they didn't have the privilege of being in the estate with us because of the work his father did. His father was a more junior, lower level staff. I started watching his life. 
because he's still growing up. He's still doing life with some of us. He's still within our circle. Of course, some have gone. I noticed that the way he thinks about life in approaching life to get results is different from the other people who grew up in that environment. Because the other people who grew up in that environment, the only thing they can think about is a job. But when I look at this guy whose father was not whose father was not within that cadre of uh, benefits, <laughs> I see that something happens in his mind that's not happening in the minds of others. Now that we are all grown and we are out of that place, that place has grass now. Deserted. Now that we are now facing life, are you getting me? What has happened is that most of these other people that I see are whining, complaining. Some of them are on drugs. The ones who didn't have the kind of privileges that we had, are you me? They are the ones who know the value of things like relationship, thinking through problems. You know why they have been in problems? To think that comfort, comfort can do two things. Either it conditions your, it conditions you to think in a particular way, are you me? Or it gives you a mindset to, have, to be able to face life. Did you get it? So one day I was talking to this very pastor and I said, see, where you grew up is, it, is it one of the biggest gifts God gave to you. Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. Are you with me? You will naturally think that that should be their best bet. Luxury. But the reason God put them there was not so that they misbehave. The reason he put them there is so that they will have a mindset they can take Eden and fill their world. Are you getting me? So grace sometimes is available in tough situations. Because there's a way that the best of people come out in their worst adversities. You get me? So sometimes being without is not a bad thing. Being without could be God positioning you for abundance. Finally let go. Because that company finally let us go. That's what I'm saying. Finally let us go. When you leave your father's house, you'll be amazed that they pay Nepal bills. See, I had to wake up early. And I'm, I'm not saying this properly. I thank God for what my parents kind of did for me. Very early, I was taught to do things. To take responsibility. So, something had been conditioned in me that look, you stand up. I know when my, when I was much younger, my mom would hold me as I remember, don't be bengi bengi. <laughs> I don't know what's bengi bengi in English. Don't be, don't be flat flat. She will hold me. She will shake me. She says, stand up. I remember we had a neighbor who had a bicycle. Very arrogant boy. Up to now, he's still there. But we didn't, I didn't have a bicycle. In fact, my bicycle was, I had outgrown my bicycle. And my dad didn't buy another one. He didn't have the money. Or it was not priority. And this guy had this bicycle. And he didn't know how to ride. So I'll, I'll be pushing him, giving him balance. While he's riding, I'll follow him. All so that he will give me the bicycle to ride. I'll push him so that he will give me to ride. Imagine. Hey. So, one day my mom noticed that's what was happening between us. And I've been pushing the guy around on the bicycle for a long time. And he gave me the bicycle. He said, ride from here to here. One very short distance. I didn't know my mom was watching inside. So I sat on the bicycle. I made up my mind. I said, I'm not, after pushing you around, just here, no, 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 no. I rode the bike very long distance. I satisfied myself. 
I now brought the bicycle to him. Man, the guy was angry. He gave me a slap. What made I started crying? What made me cry was not the slap. We are supposed to be friends. Allow me to enjoy this thing. Small. I've been pushing you, bro. I get me. So I was just so disappointed. You know, I've always had a soft heart. I was so disappointed. So I said, I'm not pushing him again. So I, I was going back home. I didn't know my mom was watching from the room, from the uh, our house. When I came home, you know, with tears in my eyes, I said, Arame, go back. She's going to slap that boy. He says, it's your mate. He says, if you cry here, I will beat the living out of you. And if my mom says she's going to beat you, I tell the truth. It's not a promise. Are you getting me? Oh, my. He said, you're not entering this house. Go back. Go and beat him. I had to choose between. I said, do I go and fight? Oh, do I? My mom just stood there. I said, go back. Go back. No, that let's say I can never forget as long as I live. That's why. See, I'm not. I look soft. You can't believe me. Don't make a mistake. No human being. As I came back, I was even being nice. I came back. I told him, I said, tell me sorry. He said, for what? I told him, just tell me sorry so that, you know, let's just resolve this thing. I'll go back and tell my mom that he apologized. The guy said, for what? I should go away. As I was talking, he lifted his eye. He wanted to give me another slap. I said, ah, we die here today. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I held that hand. He was not even half as strong as I thought. He was just a bullies are cowards. As I grabbed that hand, I don't know, my street sense, I, you know, parking? As I parked him, the guy was on the floor. On the floor there, I, sat on him, I started punching this boy. I started beating him. People came and gathered. They said, Arame doesn't fight. Why is Arame fighting? You know, Arame, you know, everybody in the new world, they knew me to be a quiet person. Arame, st stop it. They knew the other guy to be a bully. But Arame, you know, I was beating him. They now took me up. I said, leave me, leave me. <laughs> My mom ran there, came and slapped me. Arame, who taught you to fight? Why are you fighting? <laughs> Even me, I was, I was shocked. My mom said, Who taught you ever? Have you seen your father fighting before? I said, What? Come on. You know, this woman held me, dragged me. She dragged me as though she was going to beat me. When we entered the house, I said, next time. I will never forget that. One boy was bullying my son, Sammy, in school. I said, the next time, this is what you do to him. I told him exactly what to do. I said, don't pray for him. He tries to beat him. I said, bullies are weaklings. And I said, the day I come to the school, show me the boy. I will slap him. Let his father come and face me. I don't allow my children to be bullied. Never, never. I don't tell them to pray. Because life will not pray for you when he wants to bully you. You have to stand up. Sissies get punished in life. That day, a mental way was created in my mind to have. That's why in life I don't quit on anything. The only reason I quit is God said quit. When cancer came, is that same lesson that my mom taught me. That I use the principles of God's word to stand on and refuse to die. No cancer can bully me into death. Same thing with poverty. No system can bully me into poverty. It's a mindset. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them on the road that runs through the Philistine where territory. Even though that was the shortest way from Egypt <laughs> to the promised land. How many of you like shortcuts? The shortest cuts are in the mind. 
God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. If you take shortcuts, you will change your mind. So what was God developing in them? The mindset. Because there's no way they can be in Canaan if they've not in their mind seen themselves in Canaan. And I always tell people, when you have conceptualized a plan, an action plan of what you want to do, I'm going to teach you that next week, and that's how I round up. When you have conceptualized the plan in your mind on how to achieve something, no obstacle can stop you. The reason people quit is that it was not fully developed in their mind. See, they've not relished the experience of victory before they started. They just did something because everybody was doing it. Before I started church in Abuja here, I mean, I saw the church. I had to enjoy the church. I mean, I had to have the feeling of preaching to multitudes before I started. So that even when it looked like people are not coming, you keep preaching. Because you have seen the end from the beginning. The places you come to eventually are the places you first gone in your mind. And it's a conceptual process. It's anybody getting it. Not just that, ah, Pastor Robert started a church. I'm also going to start what? A church. No, no, no. You have to process it through the mind. God inspires something in your spirit. You take it and put it where? In your mind. You process it. That is the renewing of the mind. Are you with me? So you don't see yourself like people see you. This is the reason you think like this. You are not subscribing to pity. You don't say, ah, why are you not even pitying me? There's no pity here. You have arrived there first. This is when you now see the grace and the power of God working for you. Creating opportunities for you where others cannot see it. This is the reason something happens for someone. It doesn't happen for the other person. You can't cheat life. Amen. So you will not change your mind. You will not change your mind. Amen. And God is going to strengthen you and help you. Start your day with prayer and receive a fresh word from God. Join Pastor Aro Metukula on Mondays to Saturdays, 5 to 6, 10 a.m. for Incense on Fire on Mixela or Telegram at Pastor Arome. We are a praying church because we know that God answers prayers. If you have been attending church services here and are yet to commit to membership, you can start your journey to becoming all that God has designed for you to be by joining the Growth Track classes from next Sunday by 7.30 a.m. You may choose to take your classes online via growth.christfamilyministries.org. The joy of membership starts when you plug in and connect to our church community. Next Sunday, we will have the Total Life Prosperity Service by 7.30 a.m. and the Connect to Life Service by 9 a.m. here at Christ Family Center, 2nd Floor, Silverbird Galleria, Central Business District, Abuja. We look forward to receiving you with your family and friends. Prayer and communion service holds on the last Wednesday of this month here at this church venue. Mark your calendar and make plans to attend this service. You can also send in your prayer requests so we can stand in faith with you as a church. There will be a water baptism service on the last Sunday of this month by 5 p.m. If you are yet to be water baptized, Kindly drop your name at the information desk on the way out and you will get more details. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Get and listen to messages preached by our senior pastor and other anointed ministers on Telegram via the link t.me forward slash Pastor Arame or at wordshop.christfamilyministries.org Sponsor the Euphoria Devotional so we can reach more people with the Gospel. A copy goes for 1,000 Naira only and you can pay for as many copies as possible. Get a copy of Study the Word with Pastor Arome for 5,000 Naira only. 
It is a practical handbook that will make studying the Bible easy and interesting for you. For more information, you can visit www.christfamilyministries.org, check out any of our social media platforms at Christ Family Center Abuja, or visit the church office at 2nd Floor Silverbird Gallery, Central Business District, Abuja.